Hey guys, welcome to the channel. Today we are going to react to some true crime stories floating around on the internet. Let's watch. Oscar Pistorius claimed that he accidentally killed his girlfriend believing she was an intruder. Let's look at what actually happened. Reva was a South African 29-year-old model and paralegal. Reva was dating her boyfriend of three months, Oscar Pistorius, who was a Paralympic athlete. At around 6pm on February the 13th, Reva made her way to his house in South Africa. In the early hours of Valentine's Day 2013, Oscar shot her four times through a locked bathroom door. This included a fatal shot to her head. He then broke down the bathroom door with a bat and called police. Oscar claimed that he thought she was an intruder. He claimed he was hot in the night and wanted to get a fan to cool him down. While doing this, he heard a noise in the bathroom that he assumed was an intruder. He said he grabbed his gun and shouted to Reba to call police. He claimed that he did not notice that she wasn't actually in bed next to him. However, neighbours reported hearing a couple arguing at around 2am. They also heard a woman screaming at around 3am when the shooting took place. Texts between the pair are also very telling. Reba sent him this text after they'd attended a party together. Now you can pause to read, but I am just going to read out some bits that I think are very significant. She said, you have picked on me incessantly since you got back from Cape Town and I understand that you are sick, but it's nasty. She also includes a bit that he was accusing her of flirting. And shockingly, she says, I am scared of you sometimes and how you snap at me and how you will react to me. Heartbreakingly, at the end of the message, she states, I just want to love and be loved. After Reva's death, Oscar's ex, Samantha Taylor, came forward. She claimed that he would get angry at her for little things like not bringing her plate into the kitchen. He would also be jealous and possessive. In 2014, he was found guilty of culpable homicide. He was only sentenced to five years in prison. However, in December 2015, the Supreme Court overruled this verdict. He was then convicted of murder and sentenced to six years in prison. This was then extended to 13 years. Very well done. Jealousy kills. I'm glad he got another sentencing. Yeah, man. As a man, you have to learn to control your emotions. Somebody else is not your possession. I cry seven days a week. Seven! When I was 18, I was told I would never have children by a doctor. I thank God he gave me the gift of Ashley. You have no right to take her from me. This is what's left of my daughter. If I want to hug, I have to hug her box and close my eyes and pretend that she is hugging me back. Do you remember texting me? I would never, never do anything to hurt her. I swear on my life. Ashley is my bride and God. Do you remember that? Do you? Ashley was already dead. I definitely think they should do more of that to put loved ones in front of murderers, and make them feel super guilty and sad right before they get locked up or sent to the death penalty. This teacher is accused of adding a student on Snapchat and sending him something shocking. You won't believe what happened next. Ricky Lynn Lachlan is a 24 year old teacher from Missouri. Police received a tip off about an alleged inappropriate relationship between the teacher and a student. The student was just 16 years old and Ricky allegedly sent extremely inappropriate videos and pictures of herself to the child. It's alleged that the behavior then escalated to another level. She is accused of inviting the child to her home while her husband was away, but the child declined. The boy in question was interviewed by police and apparently stated that the teacher had added him on Snapchat. She then allegedly sent nude photos and videos to him. The boy told police that she requested photos back and he obliged. He stated that Ricky had warned him that she could go to prison for the actions, so to delete any photos and videos he had of her. Ricky claims that it was the student that began the conversation and that she had not been aware that he was a minor. Police seized her phone and found a video on there that matched the description of the video that the child had described. Ricky has since been arrested and charged with six felony S crimes. Man, that's some BS. That's total victim behavior right there. Once a pattern is recognized, it will be doomed to repeat again. 
The differences between male and female serial killers. Males typically kill for sexual gratification, whether that's psychological or physical, and their victim's identity matters less. They typically kill strangers. In contrast, 90% of female serial killers know their victims, and they tend to kill for practical or justifiable reasons, at least in their minds, with the most common motivation being financial gain. I'm sure there's a lot more factors to it, but yep, that's one of the big two reasons. Welcome to Famous Autopsies Part 2. In this series, I'll be breaking down famous celebrity autopsy reports, so this is a massive trigger warning. Today, we are going to be talking about Kurt Cobain, who was the lead singer of Nirvana. Kurt Cobain was outspoken about his struggles with mental health and addiction, often including it into his songs, but he also struggled with health issues. He was affected by chronic bronchitis and debilitating stomach pains. On March 31st, 1994, he fled from a rehab facility after just three days, and took a cab to a gun shop in Seattle where, according to the receipt, he purchased shotgun shells, and on April 8th, an electrician who was meant to install security lighting found what he believed to be a sleeping Kurt Cobain in a studio attached to his house. But upon closer inspection, he saw blood coming from his ears. Sadly, Kurt Cobain was dead at just 27. His external exam revealed numerous needle puncture marks, with associating bruising and an entrance wound in the front roof of his mouth. It's accompanied by several lacerations, some with tissue hanging. The lacerations are likely a result of gases leaving the barrel with strong force. The internal exam revealed that the path of the bullet was upwards, front to back and slightly left to right. His skull sustained several fractures, meaning broken in multiple places in several regions. His brain was transected by the bullet, meaning severed. The lack of blood on scene is due to the fact that the entrance wound was inside of his mouth and the bullet settled in his head, meaning there was no exit wound. Rest in peace to Kurt Cobain, you will always be missed. That man had a lot of demons. That was just the tip of the iceberg. This photo shows 41-year-old Stephen Plattel marrying his 19-year-old daughter Katie, who was pregnant with his child. Katie had been previously given up for adoption after her mother Alyssa realized that Stephen was physically abusing their daughter. But in 2016, Katie, who's now 18 years old, wanted to reconnect with her biological parents and actually ends up moving in with them. But after some time, Alyssa realizes that her husband is acting very differently and is even starting to dress better. She decides to ignore this change in behavior until 2017 when Katie gets pregnant and the father is her father. Alyssa immediately divorces Stephen and just two months later, he and Katie are set to get married and give birth to a baby boy. Both the parents attend the wedding and support the marriage until 2018 when Katie begins to see a different side of Stephen. But when she tries to end the relationship, Stephen suffocates their newborn baby and stuffs him inside of a closet. He then proceeds to shoot both Katie and her adoptive dad before turning the gun on himself. That is just a scenario I do not fully understand. Yeah. Yeah, oh, Oops! Are you okay? You fall down or what? Oh, f You need a soda or...? Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Voldemort's lesser-known eighth horcrux, William Clyde Gibson. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh, God. This looks like the reject pile at G.I. Joe. William was born in 1957 in Raleigh, North Carolina. According to him, he had a relatively decent childhood. His dad was an alcoholic, but he said he was never abused by his parents. In fact, he was quite spoiled by them. At first, he was getting bullied a lot in school, but then the tables turned when he kind of buffed out and he became the bully. William ends up dropping out of school altogether. He commits a series of like small petty crimes. He joined the army as a mechanic. He then became addicted to illegal substances. He was in prison for a year for stealing a car. By 1991, he ends up committing sexual assault. He also uh, gets involved in a hit and run, and he spends some more time in prison. And that, wow, look at it. It's gorgeous. Ugh, it's a shame he turned out to be such a shit. Well, by 2002 or so, his life of petty crimes would turn to murder. 
On October 10th, 2002, he met this woman here, 44-year-old Karen Hodella. They met at a bar. Then she ends up going back to, I guess, his apartment. And this is in Jeffersonville, Indiana, by the way. According to him, they get into an argument over prescription pills where he ends up punching her in the face, then takes out a pocket knife and repeatedly stabs her. She dies, sadly, and then he just dumps her body just like garbage. William then gets a tattoo. God, he looks like he uses the phrase yeehaw far too often. He got a tattoo of the date he killed her and then an image of a knife. Karen's body was found a few months later. A few weeks after he committed the murder, he found himself back in jail because he was driving intoxicated. Over the next couple of... Oh, yuck. Over the next couple of years, he ends up in and out of trouble. He steals money from people. He's just like in and out of jail, but he's never linked to the murder. On March 24th, 2012, he finds himself in another bar. There, he meets 35-year-old Stephanie Marie Kirk. Much like the first individual he murdered, he brought her back to his apartment where they got into a fight over prescription drugs. He then proceeds to beat her, sexually assault her, and then he broke her neck and killed her, and then tried to bury her in his backyard. On April 18th, 2012, 75-year-old Christine Wittes pays William a visit. She used to be a friend of his mom, who had passed away a few years prior. She actually was always there for William. She helped him. She gave him money. How did he pay her back? Well, on that day that she visited, he sexually assaulted her and strangled her until she was dead. And then he mutilated her body. He cut off one of her breasts. Then he just left her on the floor of his garage. He then stole her car. Her body would be found, and William was then arrested because he was caught driving her car intoxicated. I don't know when exactly this happened, but I hope it hurt. While in custody, he would just basically admit that he killed Karen Hodella. Then he said that he also killed Stephanie Kirk and he led police to her body. And then obviously he was connected to Christine Wittitz. And then he was charged with three counts of murder. He tried to claim that an evil took over him, that he was mentally not aware of what he was doing. He's crazy. But the jury didn't buy it. He first goes on trial for the murder of Christine Wittes. He's found guilty, and he's sentenced to death. His response to that was, oh well. He said it was no big deal. He then pleads guilty to the murder of Karen Hodella. Then he goes on trial for a third time, this time for Stephanie Marie Kirk's murder. Before that murder, he did this. He had death row times three tattooed to the back of his head. The courts had to make him grow his hair back out so that the tattoo would be covered before he went to trial again. He was found guilty, and he was sentenced to death again. He, of course, has tried to appeal, even though he's confessed and he pled guilty to some of these, and he's just, he's just a full-on wackadoo. He's been interviewed a lot of times since, and he's now claimed that he's murdered 10 times more people than he was found guilty of. At one point, he said he's committed at least 30 murders across many different states. But nothing has been able to confirm that. William Clyde Gibson still remains on death row, waiting for them to give him the, the business. God, that fucking mustache. Ugh. What happened to the first death penalty sentence? Why are they stalling? Is this guy gone? Breaking news, a 12-year-old boy has passed away in less than 24 hours after arriving at a camp for troubled teens. On February 2nd, the 12-year-old boy arrived at North Carolina Wilderness Camp for troubled adolescents. The following morning on February 3rd, around 8 a.m., staff members discovered that the child was not breathing. Camp counselors immediately performed CPR on the child and called emergency services. When EMS arrived, they said it appeared the child had been deceased for some time. Officials said that the day before he had, quote, been transported per parent by two men from New York. The 12-year-old had been assigned to a cabin with other students and four staff members. Authorities also added that the, quote, death appeared to be suspicious as he arrived at the camp less than 24 hours prior. An autopsy was performed earlier in the week, and a forensic pathologist said that the boy's death, quote, appeared to not be natural, but the manner and cause of death is still pending. Authorities said they executed search warrants for two of the areas of the Trails Carolina and are continuing their investigation. 
Furthermore, they said that the camp has not fully cooperated. However, Trails Carolina disputed that statement and issued a statement on Thursday through a public relations firm. They said the sheriff's office does not present an accurate account of the facts and they have, quote, fully cooperated. At this time, the child has not been publicly named and because it does involve a minor, authorities have not provided any further details. To stay up to date on this case, make sure you click the playlist below. I'll keep you guys updated. What do you think? Drop in the comments. Pretty sure is one of the staff members. Sounds like an inside job. Ah! Oh my Jesus god! Christ! What? You found it? <gasps> Literally him. Holy crap! He's a oh child welfare specialist! He works for the Depar Oklahoma Department of Human Services. It literally says, report suspe suspected child abuse. Wow. The park ranger being a child welfare specialist is worst case scenario. We entrust these people to take care of our society's most vulnerable. And instead, he's taking advantage of them and he's exploiting them. Hello? Hi, Major Flowers. In the context of Oklahoma, what does a child welfare specialist do? They're the ones that like child protective services. They're the ones that remove kids out of homes that are being abused and beaten and sexually abused and neglected. They're the ones that put the kids in state custody. In Oklahoma, that's what CPS is. It's Oklahoma Department of Human Services. Okay. He's around kids all the time. They're supposed to be there to protect kids. It's like the worst job he could have. Yeah. I will not breathe easily until he's in custody. I'm proud of the team. I'm proud of the work that we do, but none of that matters until he's in custody. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. It's really messed up. Craigslist stories that should be wiped from our memory. Number three, Michelle Wilkins. Warning, this is a really dark case. On March 18th, 2015, Michelle Wilkins, who was seven months pregnant, responded to a Craigslist ad stating that they were selling baby clothes in Boulder County, Colorado. She arrived at Danelle Lane's home where they talked about her pregnancy, and a little later on, Danelle lured her down to her basement, claiming that is where the baby clothes were. On their way down, that is when Danelle attacked her. She her hand with a lava lamp, which broke. It is thick glass. She took a piece of the lava lamp, Michelle in the neck with it, and as it was flirting from Michelle's neck, she choked her, pushed her down on the bed, held a pillow over her until she was unconscious, cut Aurora, the baby out. Aurora by then was... and carried Aurora upstairs and laid her dead in the bathtub. To everyone's shock, Michelle did survive this brutal attack, however, her baby did not. Danelle, with tears filling her eyes, was sentenced to 100 years in prison, and honestly, that is exactly what she deserves. Good job, justice system. That's a well-deserved sentence. Online dating gone wrong. This little boy went to go meet up with a girl that he was online dating in real life. And sadly, she took his life. A Toro Pino was finally meeting up with a girl named Natalie Navarro. He was talking to her online for a while and wanted to take the relationship further. But she had other plans on her mind. She was planning on robbing a Toro with another male accomplice that was 21. His name was Jardy Martinez. But before we continue, meeting people online can be very dangerous. And I want all of you to stay safe out there. So please, before meeting up with somebody, you should always use publicdatacheck.com. Because I even use it all the time before I go on dates or even meetups with new friends. There are some wicked people out there. It allows you to do background checks on anyone and has even an unknown phone lookup so you can look up numbers always calling your phone that you don't have in your contacts. So don't forget to check out publicdatacheck.com to always stay safe. Back to the story. Navarro told police that she only talked to Yardy once, the accomplice, and had only met him the night of the incident. But authorities believe this was all planned and she's lying. Do you believe her? Rest in peace to Arturo. The two are now arrested and their court cases are currently pending. First off, I appreciate the ad. That was awesome. But yeah, like I always warn you guys, you guys got to be careful out there. This was Harmony Montgomery. Harmony was five years old. Harmony will never be six. Because of this creature that she knew was her own father. And this story is one of the most disgusting things I've ever heard. In December of 2019, Harmony was in the back seat riding with that man when she became incontinent because she's special needs and it's something that just happened. She couldn't help it. And what he did in response was he reached in the back at a red light and beat her severely so bad that she died. Then he went and got Burger King and ate it in the car with his own daughter's corpse. Stored her body in a cooler at his house for months until March of 2020 when he ended up moving her to a location that we just don't know about. 
and she wasn't even reported as missing until December of 2021. I don't know how somebody else didn't report her missing within that two year time period, but that's what happened. Father has been charged with murder, child abuse, abuse of a corpse, and falsifying evidence. Father pled guilty to abuse of a corpse and falsifying evidence, but he blames the stepmother for the murder. The stepmother is currently doing 18 months for hindering a murder investigation. And in my opinion, both of these animals need to burn. There is some real sick people out there in the world. This is what our parents warned us about. It's terrifying to think that a real human actually went through this. Angela Hammond was a mother from Clinton, Missouri, and in 1991, she was at a grocery store. And you know, back then, the general public didn't have cell phones, so she went to the payphone to call her fiance, Rob. Rob says the conversation was going normal, but then Angela had said that there was this weird car that kept circling her and like driving around. So Rob, doing what any normal boyfriend, fiance, husband would do was like, get out of there, just go home, we'll talk later. So I guess that Angela thought they had left and so they continued talking, but then Angela says he came back. Then he hears her say something that I'm sure will haunt him for the rest of his life. She says, oh my God, what am I gonna do? He then hears Angela scream and then he hears silence. So Rob panicked, not knowing what to do. He knows he could call the cops, but it may be too late. He hops in his car and drives across town to go find Angela. So while on his way there, he hears someone screaming his name from a car going the opposite direction. So Rob hits a U-turn. He sees a pickup truck and in a terrible twist of fate, Rob chasing down this car when his transmission goes out and Angela is never seen or heard from again. Dude, that's like a bad scene from the movie Taken. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching these videos with me. What were your guys' thoughts on these? And as always, I will see you on the next one. Peace.